she was the most seductive, sexual image of woman ever committed to celluloid. When Hollywood bored her, she walked out on Hollywood. Uh, when men bored her, she walked out on them. She was, she's the only unrepentant hedonist, the only pure pleasure seeker I think I've ever known. And this comes over in her films. The film actress Louise Brooks, who died last summer, was celebrated as one of Hollywood's most beautiful women. But her reputation rests almost entirely on her work during a brief visit to Europe in the late 20s, and particularly for her legendary performance as the reckless pleasure seeker Lulu in G.W. Pabst's Pandora's Box. Her subsequent Hollywood career was a sad and ignominious decline. For years, she seemed to have disappeared without trace until she was rediscovered by film enthusiasts towards the end of her life. It was then that she found a new career as a penetrating commentator on the foibles of Hollywood. Power was the most important thing. The producers fought for power. Money was a means for power. And to sleep with beautiful women. It was that marvelous thing of walking around and ruling. I loved the line of, of Matt Sennett when he wanted to have his own company and he tried to talk these gamblers into backing him, horse gamblers. And the thing that finally succeeded was that he introduced them at parties to all these lovely girls. And uh, Senate said, he said, that's how they happened to invest their money. He said they decided it would be perfectly fine to own beautiful girls, actresses. And that's own. what it amounts, own. And own. that's what it amounts to. In 1982, Brooks wrote a collection of professional and personal memoirs, Lulu in Hollywood. It surprised and delighted readers, not only with its frankness, but also the assurance of its style. Our house back in Wichita, a 14-room gray frame structure, was literally falling down with books. The foundations on the right-hand side had sunk 11 inches from the weight of books in father's third floor retreat. When my older brother and I got into a fight, my father would retire to his law books and violin on the third floor, and my mother, whose sense of the absurd almost always reduced crime and punishment to laughter, often simply laughed. One day, I ran to her to confess that I had just smashed a cup from her best set of Haviland china. Without looking at me, she said, Now, dear, don't bother me while I'm memorizing Bach. She did, however, foster my dancing career. It began when I was 10. With her talent for dancing, Brooks was much in demand at local functions in southern Kansas, but she was soon on her way to New York. She enrolled at the Dennis Shawn Academy, then in the forefront of modern American dance. She starred with the principal of the Academy, Ted Shawn, in the ballet Feather of the Dawn, but the lure of the other strand of American dance was to prove irresistible. By some shift which has never been quite made clear, she was soon appearing in the George White Scandals, and then as a specialty dancer in the Ziegfeld Follies. It was New York, August 1925. Chaplin, aged 36, was in town for the premiere of The Gold Rush at the Strand Theatre on Broadway. I, aged 18, was dancing in the Ziegfeld Follies, round the corner at the New Amsterdam Theatre on 42nd Street. Submerged in my own fascinating being, I was only vaguely aware that the gold rush had brought Chaplin his greatest triumph, that he was the toast of all intellectual, cultural, and social New York. We had an affair for two happy summer months. Most of our time together was spent in a big, airy apartment atop the Ambassador. I danced, and Charlie returned to reality, the world of his creative imagination. He recalled his youth with comic pantomimes, he acted out countless scenes for countless films, and he did imitations of everybody. Isidora Duncan danced in a storm of toilet paper. John Barrymore picked his nose and brooded over Hamlet's soliloquy. A Follies girl swished across the room and I began to cry, while Charlie denied absolutely that he was imitating me. Taken at this time for Vanity Fair magazine was the Edward Steichen photograph. He is grinning, with infectious naughtiness into the camera, and at the same time, Steichen has caught his horned curls in a fawn shadow on the background. Brooks was often to be seen with the men of New York's Cafe Society. The inevitable screen offer came about through a meeting with the English-born director, Edmund Goulding. 
Did you ever see Eddie Goulding? He was the most extraordinary looking man with these brilliant blue eyes and his intensity, no matter what it is. And of course, the English accent. Now, I'm a girl in scandals, and all the girls in the Follies and Scandals was born. Don't ever have anything to do with a man who offers you a screen test. Oh, never. He is a bad man. So I was sitting down for lunch with Eddie Goulding and the Algonquin and one of the banquets. I don't know whether it's dining room or the same place. And he said, how would you like a movie test? Oh, I said, no. I said, I really wasn't scared because I'd been around a good deal. I was 17 then. I said, no, I, I, I'm not interested in movies. I want to be a great dancer like Martha Graham. Well, he said, that doesn't make any difference. He said, to hell with the movie test. How would you like to go out with me this afternoon? I had the most amazing afternoon I've ever had. Goulding was later to be ostracized for his raucous lifestyle, but at the time, he introduced Brooks to some of the most influential men in the entertainment business. I was invited to a party that night with some of the girls from the Scandals, and the men among the men were Walter Wanger and Joe Skank and Lord Beaverbrook. Lord Beaver. So we all the girls went up into this little gray suite in the Ritz and we were introduced and we had drinks and we talked. Uh, and uh, I saw that Lord Beaverbrook was very, very interested in the girl I liked most in the scandal. She was a darling girl from the South, a darling girl. And they were talking and very cozy and I watched discreetly, and they did disappear into the little gray bedroom and the little gray suite in the Ritz, and then they came out a while later. And a few days later, she told me that she had a contract at MGM. And she did go to MGM, and she did do very well. And I say, hooray for Lord Beaverbrook. <laughs> Through the influence of Walter Wanger, one of the heads of Paramount, Brooks herself moved into pictures. One of her earliest surviving films is Love em and Leave em from 1926, in which she plays a sly shop assistant, using her natural charms to make her way in the world. Brooks made an instant impact with the fan magazines of the period. Describing Louise presents its difficulties. She is so very Manhattan, very young, exquisitely hard-boiled. Her black eyes and sleek black hair are as brilliant as Chinese lacquer. Her skin is white as a camellia. Her legs are lyric. She is just 19. For my third picture, she explained, shifting herself languidly, I'm supposed to play opposite W.C. Fields in the old army game. I've played with Bill before in the Follies. Now they want me to play opposite him over there, but I'm not going to. But they've announced you in the cast, I protested weakly. Yes, said Louise, I know they have. They think I'm going to play it, but I'm not. I don't want to play a part where I race around a funny man all the time, and I won't. It was through a friend in the Follies that I came to know Bill Fields. At the florist on Park Avenue before the matinee, we would select a bouquet to be wrapped in waxed paper and present to Bill in his dressing room. It touched his heart. Bill adored beautiful girls, but few were invited to his dressing room. He was morbidly sensitive about the eczema that inflamed his nose and sometimes erupted on his hands, so that he had had to learn to juggle wearing gloves. After several devastating experiences with beautiful girls, he had decided to restrict himself to girlfriends who were less attractive and whom he would not find adrift with saxophone players. He was an isolated person. Years of traveling alone around the world with his juggling act taught him the value of solitude and the release it gave his mind. Most of his life will remain unknown. 
Racing around a funny man did have its compensations, however. Directing the film was a young man dubbed by Anita Luce the Beau Brummel of the era, Edward Sutherland. Brooks married him in 1927. By now, Paramount thought her a potential star, but it was with some reluctance that she moved to Hollywood. Eddie Sutherland gave, my husband gave absolutely the best parties in Hollywood. He gave, he invited the most amusing people, Wilson Meisner, of course, who would always insult someone uh, at a dinner party. He would rise in a stately fashion. He didn't drink. He smoked opium once in a while, but of course not at a party. But he had the most amusing people in Hollywood, uh, Eddie did. He always had uh, the best writers, and then he would have Irving Thalberg and Norma Shearer. And, 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 uh, I was supposed to be very sophisticated in Hollywood. That was purely on the strength of my having the most magnificent uh, Paris, New York wardrobe. And of course, being very sniffy, I was, don't forget I was a great intellectual. I'd read Tolstoy. And, uh, I really was just a hick from Kansas. And as Anita Luce said, when she threw me out of Gentleman Preferred Blonde, she said, Louise, if I ever write a part for a cigar store Indian, you will get it. I didn't even talk then. Perhaps as a response to these homespun qualities, William Wellman cast Brooks in one of her best silent films, Beggars of Life. After murdering her cruel guardian, Brooks disguises herself as a boy and goes on the run with hobo Richard Arlen. Having finished with our particular scenes early one night, Dick Arlen surprised me by asking me to have a drink. I was surprised partly because Dick was the undefiled type who did not touch booze, and also because his winning smile concealed a strong dislike for me. His jaw muscles twitched as he hunched close to me to deliver his monologue. It sure is too bad about your getting a divorce from a swell guy like Eddie Sutherland and a swell director, he said. When you're not his wife anymore, everybody expects Paramount to fire you. They don't know you're a pet of the front office. Funny thing, I've been working at Paramount for three years. A damn fine actor, too, and I make a stinking $400 a week while you ride around in your damn Lincoln Town Car with its damn black satin finish. You, why, you can't even act. You're not even good looking. You're a lousy actress and your eyes are too close together. Having concluded his curse upon me, Dick stood up, snatched away his bottle of whiskey, and swaggered from the lobby. In April 1928, I divorced Eddie Sutherland, leaving a pretty house in Laurel Canyon, where we'd done a lot of entertaining, for a lonely suite in the Beverly Wilshire Hotel. Staring down at my name in lights on the marquee of the Wilshire Theatre was like reading an advertisement of my isolation. Someday, I thought, I would run away from Hollywood forever. Not just the temporary running away I did after making each of my films, but forever. Louise Brooks was always to retain a very unclouded view of the attractions of Hollywood. She constantly crossed swords with her producer at Paramount, B.P. Schulberg, who was more than usually volatile because of the imminent arrival of sound. He wanted Brooks to cooperate in converting her latest picture 
the Canary murder case, into a talkie, but she was already bored with Hollywood. She was more interested in her relationship with a rich laundry magnate from the East, George Marshall. Marshall took on the management of her professional and financial affairs. He called me one day and he said, you know, in September, he said, you know, tomorrow your option comes up. He called me from Washington. I said, oh, really? He said, yes, Monte Bell, MGM called me and told me all about it. And he said, now look, when you go in to see Schulberg, he's going to tell you that he will keep you on at 750 a week, but he won't give you the raise in your option. And he said, I also know that some guy in Berlin called Pabst wants you for a very famous picture, I hear. And he'll give you $1,000 a week. So you let Schulberg talk, and when he's finished, you say, thank you, Mr. Schulberg, but I'll quit and go to Germany. And that is what I did, much to Mr. Schulberg's surprise. At the Eden Hotel, where I stayed in Berlin, the cafe bar was lined with the higher-priced trollops. The economy girls walked the streets outside. On the corner stood the girls in boots advertising flagellation. Actors' agents pimped for the ladies in luxury apartments in the Bavarian Quarter. Racetrack touts at the Hopa Garden arranged orgies for groups of sportsmen. The nightclub El Dorado displayed an enticing line of homosexuals dressed as women. At the Mali, there was a choice of feminine or collar and tie lesbians. Collective lust roared unashamed at the theater. In the review, Chocolate Kiddies, when Josephine Baker appeared naked except for a girdle of bananas, it was precisely as described by Vedekind. They rage there as in a menagerie when the meat appears at the cage. The project which had drawn Louise Brooks to Berlin was a film version of Vedekind's classic play, Pandora's Box. As a panorama of depravity and lowlife, the play was particularly appropriate to the decadence of Berlin in the late 20s. At the time Vedekind produced Pandora's Box in Berlin around the turn of the century, it was detested, condemned and banned. It was declared to be immoral and inartistic. If in that period, when the sacred pleasures of the ruling class were comparatively private, a play exposing them had called out the dogs of law, how much more savage would be the attack upon a film faithful to Vedekin's text, which was made in 1928 in Berlin, where the ruling class publicly flaunted its pleasures as a symbol of wealth and power. The new Vedekind film was in the hands of G.W. Pabst, an outstanding German director with a suitably unsentimental moral outlook. His crucial decision was the casting of the central character, the amoral pleasure seeker, Lulu. Having seen Brooks in the 1928 film, A Girl in Every Port, he decided to summon her to Berlin. We met on the platform of the station Amso, and uh, I don't know, it was just as if we'd known each other forever. It was the most curious experience I've ever had in my life. He understood me absolutely perfectly because that really was his genius. What was it that Pabst saw in her that um, convinced him that this was the person to play the part of Lulu? Well, the part of Lulu is a sort of beautiful, destructive character. And uh, if you looked at Louise Brooks, you can find all those things in her and uh, she conveyed it really quite beautifully effectively and um, she had a great depth to it which American films really never made quite use of Lulu is not a real character Vedekin said in a commentary but the personification of primitive sexuality who inspires evil unaware she plays a purely passive role. Besides daring to show the prostitute as the victim, Mr. Pabst went on to the final damning immorality of making his Lulu as sweetly innocent as the flowers that adorned her costumes and filled the scenes of the play. And when the scene was finished, he grabbed me and picked me up and he said, oh, 
but you are a dancer. Not very good, but, but what I'm getting at is that he treated everyone completely differently. Now, with Corton, with a great actor from the theater, he would take him aside, and in that careful, precise way, they would talk over everything. Now, that didn't really mean anything, because Paps never wanted a set performance. He wanted it to be new and living. In her scenes with the doomed industrialist, Dr. Schoen, Brooks found herself playing opposite one of the most eminent German actors of the time. Fritz Kortner had a histrionic style which Pabst clearly enjoyed. Nevertheless, he made sure that Kortner was unable to upstage his young star. wasn't giving his set performance at all. Of course, any director can keep an actor fresh, but he always treated Cortner as if he was going to do exactly the way Cortner. And very odd, Cortner began to bellyache about his back, this marvelous back being humped over in so many scenes. And the, he said, but you're only shooting Miss Brooks. That started the thing that he was spoiling me. And each person, this was a difficult picture because they were all difficult. The old man was difficult. He was always getting was drunk. Shagulf. He was a marvelous actor. But he shouldn't be, right? Yes. He should he, be. I'm the dirty old man. Yeah, and he even smelled the father, part. Maybe you'll Oh, he was, a, he was perfect. He, he stunk. But uh, the one he had real trouble with was Alice Robert. Her husband had put some money in the picture. She was a Belgian. She spoke just enough English to insult me. And. Uh, she was very tall and precise and... and uh, oh, did she have any idea that she was to play a lesbian? No, that's the joke. She's the she, Countess she, Gishfitz. Oh, yes. yes, and the scene she played, that was the wedding night, when uh, Courtney finds me dancing the tango with her. Uh, we were having a love affair on the side. She rehearsed the scene. Adios, machachos, compañero, demi vida. I was looking at her. And she absolutely froze and... Uh, walked off the set and perhaps looked. he was always very calm and I thought gee this is pretty funny because I'd known lesbians all my life but I thought now what the hell's he gonna do he went off and I saw them talk she in her black satin dress and pretty soon they came back and she was smiling and this is what he did he let her look as cross as possible when in a two shot with me because it was marvelous because she looked like a very repressed lesbian who was hiding it it's kind of that glare. Then when he did close-ups with her, he would stand off and play the scene with her so that she could do a true love scene with him. <laughs> <laughs> and she turned out to be marvelous. Uh, so I say he was a director like, almost every director follows a pattern, pretty much treats everyone the same, but he didn't. Most directors and most great directors, for instance, Lubitsch, they used the same technique with everyone. Lubitsch acted out every scene and acted it out marvelously. I don't know whether I could have worked with him. showing the actor how to do it. Every move, every mm. move. Eddie Goulding, the same way. He even showed Garbo how to cross the library, I, I mean the hotel lobby and Grand Hotel. And he was right, uh, uh, because they were extraordinary. Uh, but most directors are terrible. But Pabst never acted anything, but he treated everybody completely different. For instance, he sat one day uh, with me, and we were chewing on some old dead uh, sauerkraut and ham or something, and he said, Luis, this afternoon you must cry. And that's all he told me about the scene, and I went into the scene, and I cried. 
I was treated by Pabst with a kind of decency and respect unknown to me in Hollywood. It was just as if he had sat in on my whole life and career and knew exactly where I needed assurance and protection. And just as his understanding of me reached back to his knowledge of a past we did not have to speak about, so it was with the present. For although we were together constantly, he seldom spoke to me. All that I thought and all his reactions seemed to pass between us in a kind of wordless communication. To other people surrounding him, he would talk endlessly in that watchful way of his, smiling, intense, speaking quietly with his wonderful hissing precision. But to me, he might speak never a word all morning, and then at lunch turn suddenly and say, Louise, this afternoon you must be ready to do a big fight scene with Courtner. By some magic, he would saturate me with one clear emotion and turn me loose. Fritz Kortner hated me. In his role of Dr. Schoen, he had feelings for me, or for the character Lulu, that combined sexual passion with an equally passionate desire to destroy me. One sequence gave him an opportunity to shake me with such violence that he left 10 black and blue fingerprints on my arms. Both he and Pabst were well pleased with that scene because Pabst's feelings for me, like Kortner's, were not unlike those of Schoen for Lulu. I think that in the films Pabst made with me, he was conducting an investigation into his relations with women, with the object of conquering any passion that interfered with his passion for his work. One of the only surviving members of Pabst's original production team is the Russian émigré assistant director, Mark Sorkin. Pabst, any time, looking for a girl or whatever for this, or to have a name, have not a name, you know, not important. He have to be absolute born for this role. You know, that was his principle. You know. She was very independent. And she, when she working with the people in the film, she have an opinion, an opinion of what she have to do. That was her opinion. Most of the time, the opinion was right, what she had to do, most of the time. With gross overconfidence in my rights and power, I at first defied Pabst with arrogance. Pabst chose all my costumes with care. He wanted the actors working with me to feel my flesh under a dancing costume, a blouse and skirt, a nightgown. The morning of the sequence in which I was to go from my bath into a love scene with Franz Lederer, I came on the set wrapped in a gorgeous negligee of painted yellow silk. Carrying the bathrobe I refused to wear, I approached Mr. Pabst to receive the lash. Louise, you must wear the bathrobe and be naked under it. Why, I hate it, I said. Who will know that I'm naked under that big woolly white bathrobe? Lederer, he said. Stunned by such a reasonable argument, I retired without another word and changed into the bathrobe. had no idea what uh, a girl would wear in a picture. The dress designer would come down on the set with a lot of designs. The director would look at them, okay them, and that was all. He, he was not connected in any way, really, with the picture, except in the direction. The same about the sets. Pabst himself, some days, would go around if he, if he wanted shadows. For instance, going up into the attic in London, where they lived. And Pabst himself was supervised the spraying of, of the, uh, what, to make it uh, smoky. And, Everything was integrated with him. So we got back to the suit, and I said, well, that's my favorite suit, and it's damned expensive. And he said, oh, no, no, that's all right, he said. So we took it away, and the morning came to shoot the scene, and Josephine disappeared and came back with my suit. 
This is your own suit, right? Yes. I mean, not something... He often, no, he yes. often used my clothes. Half the clothes would be mine because he changed the scene and I, he'd say, bring me a dressing gown, bring me an evening or so on. So she came back with my costume and I looked at it and said, my God, the skirt had been torn and ripped and dipped in oil. The, the lovely blouse was a mess. The coat he threw away. I only wore the blouse and I began to weep. I said, that's my suit. Oh, it's, it's the way he did things that was so amusing. Because anyone else would have gotten some ragtag, bought something, yeah. dirty dirt. But he wanted something that was mine and I loved so that I would feel terrible in it. And I did. Here I was in my beautiful suit and it was ruined. So it made me feel like this. And that's how I was at the end uh, of the picture. Mr. Papp's perfect costume sense symbolized Lulu's character and her destruction. It is in the worn and filthy garments of the streetwalker that she feels passion for the first time, comes to life so that she may die. When she picks up Jack the Ripper on the foggy London street and he tells her he has no money to pay her, she says, never mind, I like you. It is Christmas Eve, and she is about to receive the gift that has been her dream since childhood. Death by a sexual maniac. And this compounded with the fact that the man who played Jack the Ripper was someone that you found enormously attractive. Yes, so. perhaps was very clever about uh, knowing whom I found attractive. The moment uh, Diesel came on the set for something or other, I don't think he'd given him the part yet. And he saw that we just adored each other. And I think that was the happiest scene of the whole picture. And this was very intimate there. It was only Diesel and I and the cameraman. And we had a lovely time between each scene. Here he is with a knife, which he's going to stick up into my interior, thrown on the table, and we'd be singing. And you would never know. You'd think we were, uh, it was really a Christmas party. Despite some lavish promotion, Pandora's box was a failure with the public. Louise Brooks cannot act, wrote one critic. She does not suffer, she does nothing. There was outrage, too, at the disservice done to a German classic. Hurrying through a hostile crowd at the premiere in Berlin, Brooks heard moviegoers shout, there's the American girl who is playing our German Lulu. But Pabst had other plans for his protege. Through the French company so far, he began to set up a film provisionally called Miss Europe. When she arrived in Paris, Brooks found that her reputation for beauty preceded her. Shop windows featured displays of her photographs, but as yet there was no finance to shoot the film. All Brooks could do was pose for the photo sessions and await developments. So there I was holed up in the Royal Monceau with nothing to do, I didn't know anybody. And all of a sudden, a uh, uh, Pabst appeared. He was on his way to London, and he asked me out, and this is a rather strange happening. He asked me out, and I went out with him and Dr. Pinez and somebody else, and uh, they said, where do you want to go? And I said, Chez Florence. It was a place with a colored band. And I went there every night. So we went there, and we sat down, and Pabst was displeased with me. I was drinking. His idea of a drink for me was a fruit salad in a, a pitcher surrounded by a little bit of champagne. 
uh, and a Kaiser cup and such things. But I was drinking a brandy or something. And over across the way, I saw Townsend Barton. He was one of the aristocrats of New York who'd gone into movies and wrote the script, incidentally, of Love and Leaving. But he quit then. He didn't care. He was rich. And there he's sitting with this great English lady, the Honorable Mrs. Daisy Fellows, which had a yacht. And, and Townsend, of course, loved money, like all rich people. And I told the waiter to tell Mr. Martin to come to my table. He didn't come. And Mr. Pabst, in the usual German fashion, had given me a bouquet of roses, a cluster of roses. Well, finally Townsend came over, and he was a tall, blonde man. And he bent over the table and said, I'm terribly sorry, Louise. He said, I couldn't leave Daisy alone. Whereupon I took this bouquet and sliced him across the face, leaving trickles from the... Uh, uh, Thorns. Oh, blood? Blood, of course. Oh, marvelous. And he, he was a gentleman, and he laughed. But Mr. Pabst, I thought he was going to kill me right there. And all the men sitting at the table from so far. And uh, Pabst said, uh, oh, I'm terribly sorry. He knew Townsend. Townsend, Townsend, that's all right, all right. He said, so Mr. Pabst grabbed me and took me back to the Royal Monceau. So, what do I do? I'm in a terrific mood, so I decide to banish his disgust by giving the best sexual performance of my career. I jump into the hay and deliver myself to him, body and soul. He acted as if he'd never experienced such a thing in his life. You know how men want to pin medals on themselves when they excite you. They get positively radiant. Next morning, Mr. Paps was so pleased he couldn't see straight. Hoping that the affair might continue, Pabst hastily set up a new project Diary of a Lost Girl, from a novel by Margareta Burma. But by the time he could arrange for Brooks to come to Berlin to begin filming, she had a new lover. This time I had in tow the Eskimo. But they called him the Eskimo because his hair was perfectly blonde, so that it looked like a white fur cat. He was living on a small allowance when I met him at a party. He said, and who is this? I, I said, the Eskimo. I, the Baron Beak, I said, he was family. He was really a Baron, but that didn't impress Pabst. So all the time we made a diary, I had uh, Esky in tow. Diary of a Lost Girl records the downfall of a virginal girl at the hands of a callous seducer. Pabst assembled a powerful cast from his repertory of actors to fill out this pallid fable. Fritz Rasp, as you know, plays the uh, mm -hmm. chemi uh, chemist assistant who seduces me first. And came the time when we were to do the scene where he has made me promise that I will get out of bed at 11 at night and come down and meet him in the uh, pharmacy. So he perhaps went through a lot of nightgowns and he'd feel them and finally he picked out a nightgown. And now he said, you've got a lot of Japanese robes at home, silk with short ones like this, but soft. Now he said, let's go and look in your trunk. So we went and we looked through my trunk and he picked out a soft blue and white and he said, that's it. where we talk and then Rasp holds me and then we turn and he was a very big man which helped and I liked him very much of course and then I faint and fall down and just in one marvelously graceful swoop he picks me up just like a beautiful piece of silk. And that's all, really. Sex is so different now, isn't it? But you got more sex out of that scene, just the way he picked me up and moved right out through the curtains. So this was all a scene of touch, almost no words. Just, it was really a, a ballet. Thank you. 
It was during the making of Diary of a Lost Girl, on the last day of shooting, to be exact, that Mr. Paps moved into my future. We were sitting gloomily at a table watching the workmen while they dug a grave for the burial scene when he decided to let me have it. Some weeks before, he had met the friends, the rich Americans with whom I spent every hour away from work, and he was angry. First, because he thought they prevented me from staying in Germany, learning the language and becoming a serious actress as he wanted. And last, because he looked upon them as spoiled children who would amuse themselves with me for a time and then discard me like an old toy. Your life is exactly like Lulu's, he said, and you will end the same way. I just sat sullenly glaring at him, trying not to listen. Fifteen years later in Hollywood, with all his predictions closing in on me, I would hear his words again, hissing back at me. Canary murder case had been Brooks' last Hollywood silent film before her departure to Germany. At the time, she had refused to cooperate on its conversion to sound, but when she returned to Hollywood, she found that the studio had got around the problem without her. Miss Odell, may I see you for a few moments, please? It won't get you anything, but come ahead. Thank you. Paramount had managed the conversion with considerable expense and difficulty, well, using a dubbed voice and, for some shots, a Louise Brooks look-alike. How much? Nothing doing, Mr. Spotswood. I've decided to marry Jimmy. I'm afraid that marriage is quite out of the question, Miss Odell. Oh, you're sure about that, are you? I'm positive. Well, how would you like me to tell the world about Jimmy's embezzling from your bank? What? You heard me. You know, Jimmy has a weakness for writing letters. And I have a weakness for using them. If Jimmy did write you a letter, you'll tear it up. Now, before I leave here. Sure. Go ahead, tear it up yourself. My memory's still perfect. Oh, yes, yes, I see. Yes. Very well. You win. When I went back to Hollywood in 1930, I knew I was going to take it on the chin because I was pretty elegant, pretty grand. I was slumming. In Hollywood, these illiterate people. <laughs> so when I went back broke in 1930, uh, oh, I had a job with Harry Cohen. And I wouldn't go to work for him. He'd make me come to his office. It was really entirely her own fault, and she herself admits that, that she came back from Europe, where she'd achieved this kind of prestige by working with Pabst and Janina and Rennie Clare. And she came back and felt that the films she'd been doing in Hollywood were basically just junk, which they were, really weren't. I mean, that's the way she felt about them. And she wanted to do the prestige films, the big films in Hollywood. That was just the wrong time for it, that transition to sound. Uh, they weren't making that kind of film. They were just trying to keep their heads above water. They were concentrating on uh, talk for its own sake. And it was exactly the wrong time to be temperamental, and that's what she seemed to be doing. And she gave Paramount a very hard time, and in return, they gave her a hard time and literally sabotaged her career. Oh, 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 look out, here they come. Give me that ankle. Oh, oochie, woochie. Mm, oh. Pat it all better. Mm, gun, gun, gun. <laughs> Did you hurt yourself? Oh, what happened? What happened then? Come on, boys. Come on. Hold it, hold it, wait a minute. Oh, what a shot for the Sunday edition. Would you mind raising the skirt just a little bit? We want to show the injured ankle. Thank goodness she's got... All Paramount would give Brooks were two lines as a glamorous walk-on who disappears after the first scene in the film. Hey, hey. Yeah, and what's more, I'm going to send you the doctor's bill. Oh, you are, are you? You can't go around hurting girls' ankles like that. What do you think you are, a chiropodist? They crashed while eloping with a chorus girl. Snubbed by Paramount, huh? Brooks was reduced to working for one of the minor studios, the Educational Pictures Company. Her rather shadowy director was William Goodrich, none other than the disgraced silent star, Fatty Arbuckle. Educational were makers of low-budget, two-reel program fillers. I 
got a job to do a film at Educational. I didn't know who the director was. I think they were two real comedies. I've forgotten what they were called. And I needed the money, so I took the job, and I got into this outfit, or whatever it was, and went on the set, and who was sitting there but Batty Arbuckle, sitting in a chair. He smiled at me, and I smiled at him. I knew him and adored him, of course. Everyone did. And uh, he held a script in his hand, and he sat in that chair, really. And, and uh, I swear to goodness, he didn't move through the direction, whatever. I think it took two weeks that long to make this silly picture. But he didn't move. He didn't pretend to be uh, happy or pleased or... Uh, he was really like a person who'd already died. You, you had that feeling. In 1936, Brooks made another desperate attempt to restart her career, but she was told she'd have to begin again in the chorus. This still was circulated with the caption, Louise Brooks, former star who deserted Hollywood seven years ago at the height of her career, has come back to resume her work in pictures. But seven years is too long for the public to remember, and Louise courageously begins again at the bottom. The quaint B series, The Three Musketeers, provided in 1938 the setting for Louise Brooks' last appearance in a Hollywood film. In the episode Overland Stage Raiders, she added romantic interest to the antics of the leading men, including the young John Wayne, whose career was about to take off as hers was about to finish. I think it's time you and I had some serious conversation. That's no lie. Why, well, you said that like you had the weight of the world on your shoulder. Maybe I have. Tony, there's something I've got to tell you. Something I should have told you a long time ago. Somebody jumped out. There's another one. Head back for the airport. I'll see what it's all about. I think Overland Stage Raiders is a little disappointing because Louise in that particular film had a fairly, even though she was the leading lady, had a fairly small part. And she had a totally new sort of modern hairstyle. So she didn't even look like the Louise Brooks we all knew. And it was rather a, you know, sad way to go out in a sense. They'll find a clause in that contract that says they can't take you away from Aura Grande. And that goes for you, too. Try to keep me away. If we need any more aviators, tell them about me and Wrong Way Corrigan. <laughs> OK, all right. <laughs> Come on, let's go. By the early 50s, Louise Brooks had become a forgotten name. It was to this dingy area of New York's east side that a silent film enthusiast came in September 1955. It was such a, ter a terrible shock. Anyone who had looked the way she had to find that she was in the most deplorable, imaginable, physical condition from having just lived on almost nothing but alcohol for years and years and years. She was enormously bloated. Her hair was unkempt, hanging around her face like the very witch of Endor. She wore those enormous frog-like space shoes and a rusty old overcoat that she called her, her uniform. I could make no connection. It was, uh, it was almost as though she were kind of a Lon Chaney in reverse, somebody so remote from the individual that I knew that it's, it seemed unlikely that it was, was actually the same person. Obsessed by his vision of the former star, James Card set about the rehabilitation of Louise Brooks. 
Central to his strategy was moving her to the respectable town of Rochester, upstate New York, where he was curator of the Eastman Museum. It was in the museum's viewing theater that he showed Brooks many of her films for the first time, including the postscript to her European career, Miss Europe, which had finally been made as Prix de Beauté in 1930. Seeing her old films was a revelation for Brooks. She'd been contemptuous of her work as an actress, but now she began to reevaluate her life in films. Part of this process was to write about her screen experiences, at first for the Eastman Museum Journal. She became known among film enthusiasts and began to make occasional appearances at festivals. At the Louise Brooks season at the Paris Cinémathèque in August 1959, Henri Langlois declared, there is no Garbo, there is no Dietrich, there is only Louise Brooks. Her articles began to appear in film magazines in France and England. When she began to write, of course, she wrote for a whole series of magazines which were rather esoteric. They never had wide readership. And when Kenneth Tynan tracked her down and was able to write his really fabulous essay in the New Yorker. This changed everything. I thought, for some reason, that she may be dead because she hadn't made a film since, I think, 1938. And I was delighted to find she was alive and living in Rochester, New York, in a two-room apartment, in, not in poverty, but uh, not in munificence either, living as an invalid, crippled with arthritis, in a state of extreme buoyancy, alone, but not lonely. The interest generated by Kenneth Tynan's New Yorker article brought about the publication of Lulu in Hollywood. Its worldwide success was an unexpected postscript to Brooks' career in movies. That's why I was never an actress. I never was in love with myself. I would go to a party and I'd see Dolores Del Rio and. Constance Talmadge and, and Constance Bennett, all these beautiful women, I'd say, you're the ugliest one here. You're black and furry, you've got freckles, your dress is not as attractive. And in the end, so it, unless you can't be a great actress, unless you think you're beautiful, and you, uh, it's of the essence. And uh, I remember- I'm, I'm wondering what sense you mean a great actress, because- I mean a great you're, actress. But you're a contradiction of this. No, I'm not. To be a great actress, you must know what you're doing. When I write my little piece, I know exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. When I acted, I hadn't the slightest idea what I was doing. I was simply playing myself, which is the hardest thing in the world to do. Mm -hmm. you, you can give most actors any part in the world and they can play it, but this, they say, be yourself, they get terribly self-conscious. But since I never learned to act, I never had any trouble playing myself. The great art of films does not consist of descriptive movement of face and body, but in the movements of thought and soul transmitted in a kind of intense isolation. I played Pabst's Lulu, and she isn't a destroyer of men like Vedicans. She's just the same kind of nitwit that I am. Like me, she'd have been an impossible wife, sitting in bed all day, reading and drinking gin. Lulu's story is as near as you'll get to mine. 